Okay, thank you very much. That was a great introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about bioinspiration and its application to engineering. So not just robotics, but I like robots, so we'll talk a little bit about robots too. This is one of um, the robots that one of my students, Jamil, uh, has worked on. He's here in the audience today. Uh, all of the work that I do is possible because of the students that work with me, so they're fantastic people. Okay, so the engineering process starts with a little bit of inspiration, and Gwen was talking earlier about inspiration being sort of that 1%, and then it leads to invention, which is the perspiration part, which is the other 99%. When we're talking about bio-inspiration and how it's applied to engineering, we're talking about going from this to this. If the video plays. <laughs> Imagine for a moment a jumping robot, okay? <laughs> All right, so the 1% was about one day worth of a photography that I did in a dog park. Oh, we went back, hold on. Go back. Four years of the 99% was the, the work spent on doing experiments on these robots. Now, when we're doing engineering there and, and, and the invention that goes along with engineering, there's two aspects that I want to highlight. There's the context of the engineering that you're doing, and that means the institutional context or the socioeconomic context of the, of the society that you live in. Institutionally, it means that if you're doing invention at, uh, say, Ford, you're probably not going to be making pacemakers. But if you work at a hospital, that institution will be a, a good place for you to be working on pacemakers or, or, or test tubes or things like that. Um, when we're talking about, about Ryerson, institutionally, it's really important that we have places like the Digital Media Zone, where that allows ideas to be incubated, incubated with the students and that. At the same time, we have stimulation. And stimulation can be uh, the rivalry between two different companies. Stimulation could be... Um, let me see, it could be necessity. So, um, you know, there are problems in society, we need to fix them. That could be the, the sort of um, uh, stimulation that we're talking about as well. In addition, there can be this curiosity business, the sort of thing where you got this itch and you got to scratch it, and you got to invent something to scratch that particular itch. That's the sort of stimulation that we're talking about. On top of that, you've got this inspiration that happens at any given moment in time. It could happen um, because of a tragedy in your family. It could happen because you're working on a problem and all day, all day, and, and you, can't, you can't figure out the solution to it. You go to sleep that night, and the next morning, just like that, you've come up with a solution. You've been inspired in your sleep. Sometimes that process is very uh, straightforward and sometimes not so much. But all of it leads to the possibility of invention. And when we talk about invention um, and the application of bioinspiration to invention, one of the things that keeps coming up is the application of bioinspiration to flight. We think of birds and their application to the creation of Boeing 747s, for instance. And back in the day, the early pioneers of, of aircraft looked to the only example of flying machines that they saw birds and bats, things that they saw in nature, and they said, well, if birds are so good at flying, and I would like to do that, I should make an airplane that looks like a bird. And people like Otto Lilienthal, a German who, who lived in Berlin, uh, did that. He built a great big hill, because Berlin's relatively flat, great big hill, and strapped pieces of wood and tissue to his body and threw himself off the hill. This guy was very passionate about the work that he was doing. Um, and he did relatively well. He sort of he could glide with his with his, these things strapped to his back. But one day, he had an accident, fell out of the sky, broke his back, and died within a few days of that. On his deathbed, he said, "Small sacrifices must be made." He was deeply committed to the development of, of flying machines. And unlike that talk that we saw earlier today, where the idea was or the comparison was made between other. Uh, aeronautics pioneers and the Wright brothers, and the reason why the other people didn't work out was because they weren't passionate about their work, they didn't have that why. Otto really knew what he was doing. He really knew why he was doing it. He just failed in the process. I would like to think that the difference between what Otto did and what the Wright brothers did is the Wright brothers didn't look to birds for their inspiration. Instead, what they did is they applied traditional engineering techniques, the stuff they learned in their bicycle shop, they created wind tunnels. They created a control mechanism so that the pilot could actually control the aircraft as it was, as it was flying so that it wouldn't fall out of the sky. That's what made them successful. They had as much passion as Otto did. They just took the right engineering approach to solving the problem. 
Now, this talk's supposed to be about bioinspiration, so why do I start off with something negative? Well, it's because I want to talk, to compare that, to contrast that with the right approach to bioinspiration. But to talk about bioinspiration, you have to know a little thing or two about biology. And if we're going to talk about biology, we have to talk about evolution. And if we're still talking in terms of flying machines, we can talk about birds and we can talk about bats. Birds and bats both fly. They both have four limbs that developed into wings, one with feathers, one without. They follow different paths along the tree of evolution, the evolutionary tree, and yet they were still able to come up with a solution to the, to the problem of flight. If you were to come up and, like me, try to make a, a robot to do something, something like this, I wouldn't think about putting feathers on this particular robot because I'm pretty sure it wouldn't help it fly. But I would probably try and adapt engineering techniques to this imagined creation to make it fly properly. So it's important to know where your inspiration is coming from on this evolutionary tree and what sort of evolutionary dynamics applied to it to get it to where it was. The other thing to know about evolution is that evolution is not a mechanism for perfect design. It isn't. It's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism for just good enough design, which is kind of weird. It's kind of a strange concept to think about. And when we say that it's good enough, the question is, good enough for what? And the answer is making babies. It's for rep reproduction. <laughs> okay, so we're going all over the map with this. But it's really important to realize that, because at the end of the day, you're not making a perfect flying bird, what you're doing is making a bird that is good enough to find another bird so they can have sex and make babies. That's effectively what's going on. I'm sure none of you thought I was going to talk about that when I was talking about engineering. <laughs> okay? So it's good enough just for that. The next thing that's important to talk about is what, what are referred to as evolutionary leftovers. So um, last year, I went to Belgium, I met up with a colleague um, at a zoo in Antwerp, and in there, this is me, I got underneath a giant whale. This is the whale right here. They are incredible animals. It's very intimidating standing underneath a whale skeleton. You get an appreciation for how big it is. But I don't want to talk about how big the whale is. I want to talk about two little bitty things at the back of the whale. These things. These are the remnants of the legs that whale's ancestors had when they were four-legged animals living on the ground years and years and years ago, the ancestors of present-day whales. If you were to take a whale and say, this is an inspirational animal, I want to make something that is inspired by whales, I want to be bio-inspired by whales, the last thing you would want to do is to take those two little bitty things and apply it to whatever it is that you're trying to make. It doesn't matter what you're making, those little things which are embedded in the blubber in the back of the whale, no good, don't do it, okay? So evolutionary leftovers, very important to know. So you have to know a thing or two about evolutionary biology. Let's talk about a positive example of bioinspiration al along the lines of the whale theme here. Um, here in Ontario, we've heard a lot about the problems with wind turbines, yeah? People get sick because they make noise and things along those lines, and, and depending on your perspective on it, you may or may not believe them. However, they are relatively noisy things, and they're not terribly efficient either. They convert uh, wind energy into electrical energy, but they don't do it with 100% efficiency. There's this guy who was in uh, the boutique of, of some shop somewhere and saw a model of a whale and looked at the, it was a humpback whale, like this one right here, with bumps on its flippers. And he said to himself, well, this is nuts. If a, a whale, which is supposed to be maneuverable in the water and, and fast and, and quiet and, and all this sort of thing, is supposed to maneuver properly in the water, it shouldn't have bumps on its flippers. And then he started doing tests of the bumps on these flippers. And he said, oh my goodness, this is quieter, more efficient, more maneuverable. It's better. It's better than smooth blades on the wind turbine. Maybe we can make wind turbines with bumpy blades just like we see on whales. And this permits the possibility for quieter, more efficient, better wind turbines that we might one day see here in Ontario. Okay, so this is a good example of bioinspiration, one that directly is applicable. After that, quiet trains. Has anybody here ever been to Japan? A couple of people maybe, yeah? They've got these really fantastic fast trains. They're just a little bit faster than the GO trains that we have here, okay? <laughs> They have a particular problem, these trains. As they go from point A to point B very, very quickly, sometimes they have to pass through mountains, tunnels in these mountains. And as they exit the tunnel, 
They make a very, very loud sound. The travel, they're, they're, they're going from one medium to another medium, and that noise that's made disturbs the people that live around that tunnel. One of the engineers on staff thought to himself, well, I'm a bird watcher, and I've looked at kingfishers that dive from the air into the water. And as they dive into the water, they don't make any splashing. They don't make any noise. They traverse from one medium to another perfectly. And he thought to himself, well, what if we took the front end of this train and made it to look like a bird? And sure enough, this is why we have funny-looking trains in Japan. Okay, next, galloping robots. Hopefully a vid video will play, but I guess not. No, okay, we'll imagine, okay, galloping. Okay, jumping up and down. Okay, I studied uh, galloping for a few years when I was a PhD student at McGill. And I spent the first day of my research taking pictures of dogs and saying, this is fantastic. How do dogs work? This is what it goes through engineers' heads. How do animals work? And I thought, well, this is a really complicated problem. They have muscles, they have, they have uh, muscles, they've got bones, they've got joints, you've got to feed them. This is really complicated stuff. I thought, I can build a robot that is a simplified version of a dog. And if I build it, and I can reproduce the sort of motion that we see in dogs, maybe I'll be able to figure out how dogs work. And so bio-inspiration can lead to not only the development of an object, an engineered object, but also insight into how the animal world works. And then maybe we can take that insight and apply it to crutches or walkers for geriatric patients or things along those lines. And so bioinspiration can take you in directions that you don't normally think of before. Okay, so what are the sort of the take home message? What is the take home message here? If you want to be bio inspired and you want to do something meaningful with that bio inspiration, first you have to understand a thing or two about biology. Two, you have to know how devices work. So, how do transistors work? How do gears work? How do they come together? How do you create systems? So, how are devices made? How is that manufacturing process working? How do you bring all this stuff together? And if you can and you've got the right context and the right stimulation, maybe you'll be able to have a good bio-inspired design. Okay, so the words that leave me with all this. The next thing is that I want to go back for a moment to my negative view of bio-inspiration in aircraft. And hopefully the video that will come up will actually play this time. It turns out, my point of view now, is that the Wright brothers and Otto Lilienthal and the rest of those pioneers in the aviation industry didn't have the right tools to create true bio-inspired devices. They couldn't make a bio-inspired flapping-winged aircraft. Today, and the video's not working, okay. Today, Google SmartBird, okay. Uh, Google's an awesome thing. The SmartBird is a true flapping-winged robot airplane. It was released this year, it's actually one of the TED Talks, and it actually looks like a seagull with flapping wings. It's a fantastic thing. It's really, really amazing. Anyway, unfortunately, the video didn't work today. But the message I want to leave with you is effectively this, that if you have the right context for work, like we have here at Ryerson with the Digital Media Zone, the right context for doing really good creative work, if you have the right stimulation, the right sort of rivalries, the right sort of creativity, if you have the right background in biology and you understand where um, the, the dynamics in biology are coming from and how to apply that. And if you've got good background in how devices are made and how to bring systems of devices together, then hopefully you'll have a good bio-inspired engineered device. With that, I would like to thank you very much.